Okay, we are live with Paul. How are you, my friend? Paul, P. doing well. I'm doing well, Sonny. Thanks for having me. It's a sunny day and I'm on a show with Sonny. So, I mean, couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. My Actually, friends I could be honest. I'll be honest. I could definitely could be better. I think everyone in the world was probably saying it could be better. But in retrospect, I'm pretty fortunate and happy with where we're at in, in the industry. I don't work for a restaurant. And so I've got, I'm, I'm employed and um, company doing well and crypto is doing well. We're not talking about all time highs today, but overall, <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> but, uh, I was just yeah kidding about that. We 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 can definitely talk about it. I'm just uh, you know a, a bit more intrigued by other things such as yeah. such as the mm. topic of building on Bitcoin, Paul. That that's really the kind yeah. of the theme is is mm -hmm. one of my goals is to is to uh, I always say like the the price is literally the least exciting thing about Bitcoin. You know I think there's so many. I mean okay maybe that's a hard one. What happened? I see like fingers crossed under the camera there. You know, it's like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> sure, sure. The price is the least exciting thing of Bitcoin. It, well, it's, it. it's like a sexy thing to say at least, right? So yeah. why not? It, it, so. it helps fund the industry. It helps keep some fire in the industry. It funds projects in, in many ways. Um, it helps drive uh, resources to the industry to build stuff that in a way matters more than the price. So it's, it's a fuel to kind of enable other aspects of the industry. That, so, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I meant. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I usually like to start with uh, where we met uh, for the first time. Um, I'm trying to remember. I remember. That... Actually. You do? Okay, do cool. Where, I actually do remember. Uh, I believe it was Miami, um, Moe's Conference, way back. Uh, when was it? 2014? January of 2014? No, 2015. I think January 2015, I believe. Um, you know, you're I still with there. Coin. Yeah, yeah, yeah January yeah. 2015. And it was just one of the, you know, after parties, chatting at the bar kind of thing. So I do remember meeting over there, although it's been many other, I actually don't remember many of the in-betweens <laughs> after that, you know, but uh, I usually frequently remember the first time. But yeah, I was over at a bar in Miami, just one of the after parties in there. In the bear market, it was just kind of like gloom, you know? Mm, like I said, mm. price isn't the most important thing. And we've, we've come out of that. Well, that's what's fascinating is right because because look, there are a lot of people who kind of come and go as the price comes and goes, but there mm -hmm. are others who see something, you know, a bit different. And, and so, so anyway, so what I'm trying to capture, uh, one of the main things is it, normally, you know, in, in some sort of podcast, it's like, well, you know, give us, give us your 30 second, you know, backstory. Uh, so this is the opposite of that. It's not the 30 second backstory. Uh, the podcast is about the backstory. And the reason I find that's that it. interesting is because is because I'm always curious to see what people's lens were, uh, what their lenses were, kind of looking in to as they were coming into Bitcoin, and then and right. then and then you know you know obviously this maybe doesn't apply to everyone, but I, I always feel like a lot of the people I know, Bitcoin acted as a bit of a singularity event, as like a, almost <laughs> like a you know like this, this bring it all point. together bring it all together, almost like unimaginable, like for me, at least I know prior to learning about Bitcoin, it was almost unimaginable that that something like this could even exist and, and the kind of impact that it could have um, on the world. Um, and so, so, so I, I like to understand kind of the story after, you know, learning about Bitcoin and how that, you know, changed kind of the trajectory of your career, your, your life view. Totally. So that, that is, I would say the first one, Let, so let's start there. And then, then obviously the, the second big question is around edge and, you know, the story around that. And I'm sure our first story will, will kind of dovetail into that but but really curious yeah. man so what's uh where, where are you from where are you, are you from california are you from elsewhere I'm in california you can say i'm from california i was born in the philippines actually migrated over here when i was five mm. um you know always fascinated about american culture i watched the cartoons disney superman and all that kind of stuff and my parents um at the time the philippines wasn't a great place to be it's also still kind of rough right now um economy wasn't uh our economy was struggling at the time we we're under a dictatorship mm -hmm. this is in you know, late seventies and in the early eighties family had migrated over. Mm. And so we're a classic migrant family kind of trying to figure out how to make ends meet in, you know, the U S with, you know, admittedly more opportunity. Um, I, uh, grew up here, uh, for pretty much since grammar school through high school, college up until now, this is kind of what I consider home. Um, and almost entirely in California, admittedly, I spent a little bit of time in Delaware. My sister was born over there. But mm. I'm kind of a California and California at heart for all of its good and bad. And I guess that kind of fit with my personality being in tech. Mm. You know, I, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I went to high school in San Francisco, once again, for all of its good and bad. Um, and I didn't realize how 
at the center of that industry I was, you know, and you grew up just, you go to school and you go home and you play with your friends and whatnot, not realizing this giant kind of ecosystem of technology getting built around you. Mm. And whenever I would want to build a computer back in high school, I would go get parts, not realizing that God, those chips being built by Intel and Nvidia and whatnot are just like around the corner. Like I'm going to the store and like within a few blocks, there's like, you know, the office of one of the main um, companies that is putting together the parts for all of this technology that I'm building. And so it was uh, a good fit in that sense, you know, and um, happy to, that it came together the way it did and how I ended up in that location. Um, and, you know, that's kind of told a lot of the story of my life. I've been in technology almost the entire, almost the entire way. Although, you know, we can talk about it later, but I did have a break, which I think really, really shed some light and interest into the world of, of cryptocurrency. But you know, for the most part, it's been a, so as a kid, so when did life. you get your first computer? First you know? computer was a good old, oh yeah, uh, Commodore 64 when I was, I think about, uh, what's first grade nowadays or second grade, uh, I, whatever that age is, like seven? Yeah, 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 yeah. and what, what pulled you in? Like, uh, was it like games with nibbles or I don't know? I was definitely, was Tetris? I was definitely I a gamer, so I had an Atari 2600, you know, back yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before, like pretty much at first grade, I had an Atari 2600. Yeah. Um, was big into gaming. You know, I was uh, the kind of kid that, you know, I went out and, you know, rode my bike and did outdoor stuff, mm. but I didn't kind of just, you know, openly socialize with friends and just hang out and, you know, play like Dungeons and Dragons. I was more on in the actual electronic gaming space. And so I loved the 2600. When my parents would bring me over to uh, various department stores, I would just run into the section with the Atari, like the Atari computers. You know, the Commodore computers, play games, mess around with it. And then I think it was, yeah, I think like second or third grade, maybe a little bit later, I started asking my mom, like, what does it mean when I have to type these commands to launch my game? Because my mom was actually a programmer too. So she was oh, trained in, was she? Okay, in, so in software. Like you. <laughs> so you had yeah, a Yeah, no, exactly. A I had kind of edge. a technical family in that sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was actually my mom that was technical. My dad wasn't. He was mm -hmm. uh, an architect, real estate agent, um, kind of an inverse of what you typically see in American culture where, you know, the male technology, the female less techno techno technologically inclined. But I remember on the Commodore, in order for you to load a game, all right, good old stick the floppy disk into the drive and to do the load space, print, you know, uh, quote, star, but you have to type these little commands, comma eight, comma one, to run the program. And I started looking up like, what exactly is that doing? Okay, what does load mean? And, you know, the Commodore came with a basic manual to show you how to program in basic. And I think at the, you know, at the level of third grade, I started learning how to just make a loop. A for loop was already part of like, you know, simple basic. And it was print your name, Whoa. loop, do it again, do it a hundred times. And at that point, I'm like, wow, this is kind of fascinating. Um, I can actually make something, I can build something, which I, I think that defines myself and a lot of people in tech, as well as people outside of tech, like carpenters, artists, is that we like to build stuff. Like I want to see something come out of nothing. And that's a certain character trait um, versus people that can kind of like manage um, other people or maintain something or um, uh, service an industry or service people like a service sector. Those are different character traits. And definitely I fit into that kind of build, build something character trait. And that was what fascinated me is you could build something without having to have a lot of physical this and that's and wood and whatnot. Um, and so that was kind of the trigger, that good old Commodore 64 from back in the 80s. And what, and what did you, what kind of stuff did you build back in the day? Just like, I guess, games and stuff? like, well, what else would you so really I didn't think build much. Building? I mean, I was, I was young. I didn't know what to build. Um, the first trigger of, of building actual software came, I think around sixth or seventh grade where my dad was a real estate agent. How many people out there have received those mail outs from real estate agents, right? They send you flyers. They send you this and that saying, Hey, would you like to sell your house? You're looking for a house. It's probably less popular now because you've got everything online, you've got Zillow and whatnot. Mm. But back in the 80s, that was like half, it felt like half your mail. Well, my dad was in that industry and he had a, a region of the neighborhood that he kind of owned relative to his um, co-workers at you know, his, his real estate a, uh, agent office. And so he had a list of addresses and he had to mail them out. Mm. Well, there wasn't really good technology at the time to be able to mass mail a bunch of you know, flyers and whatnot. So I created a database on the Commodore. I think at the time it was a 128 or 64, 128 that would allow us to enter like data, enter all of this information as well as print it onto labels 
And then I hired some of my buddies and cousins to literally stick labels on envelopes, like hun hundreds of envelopes and either drop them in the mail or sometimes physically just put them into, into people's envelope uh, in, into people's mailbox in the, around the neighborhood. And that was kind of my first entrepreneurial gig. And it was Sweet. called Miracle Miracle Mailouts. And I think from there we had you know hundreds of paper cuts from closing envelopes, <laughs> you know, moist fingers from having you know the sponge in the water and whatnot. But at the core of it, what really was um, uh, interesting for me was building that database. Mm. You know, I wish I still had the code for that. It was you know it's basic on a Commodore. I put it out on shareware. You know, if you know that term shareware, you just put it out on I do. You know, uh, open source. It was actually compiled. So I don't know if it was open source, but people would just donate if they liked it. And actually quite a lot of people gave me feedback about it. And I was like, oh, this is great. Blah, blah, blah. Awesome. Thanks. How old yeah, are you? Like uh, this is about seventh, seventh grade. What is okay. that? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Around like 12-ish. Okay. 12, okay. 12, 13 ish And so simple database, you know, simple concept, still using floppy drives. <laughs> so it wasn't convenient, but it got the job done, you know, printing labels. Simple as that. So that's that's kind of my first foray into software uh, programming, I guess. I would and call did you it have here. any like lessons that you came out with? Were you, did you, I mean, aside from the paper cuts? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, did um, you learn anything there? Were you just like, all right, this I, is fun? It was probably the sloppiest. Like... It was it was fun. It was probably the sloppiest, messiest code. Um, I don't recall <laughs> what I had done to, to get that thing to work, but it was fun building. And I remember at the time, a lot of people you, you could just download software like the internet didn't exist, right? It just wasn't there. And the way to get software would be to buy a magazine, like a Commodore magazine or whatnot. And then at the very back of the magazine would be pages and pages of numbers. Like, I don't know if people remember, this, is, this was how you could install new software kind of for free on your computer because you couldn't download it. And what you'd get is literally pages and pages of numbers and you would type them into your computer and then save them in a file and then run it. <laughs> what you were literally doing is you were typing the binary code of the program and running it on your computer. So it's like the compiled code. It's as if someone took um, an executable off your computer and then printed all of the binary code and then had you type it in. A lot of the magazines were full of this and some would be little games, some would be you know, utility software, some would just be a little demo, like a graphic demo, but that's how you would kind of type in a program. That's how you would download and use a program because print media was the media at that time. Um, and that kind of triggered a little bit of the, oh, there's something I could do to create these images on screen. There's something I could do to create this functionality. Um, and that's that kind of triggered a little bit of the, can I learn the language that creates all of that binary information? So that was, oh, yeah. like I said, that was the, the trigger. Yeah, that, 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 like, that took me into a bit of a matrixy kind of zone where I was like, oh, what, yeah. what, a, what, a, what a beautiful uh, kind of visceral you know, um, like relationship with, with computing, yeah. right? Because nowadays it feels like it's like abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction. And it's oh, like, yeah. it was. and it's like everything's super even code easy, under there? like what's Are actually happening? Like it's just it's magic, right? But, but I actually, yeah. um, I, I studied electrical engineering and assembly was my, was one of my, mm -hmm. I'd say hardest classes, but it was like it's the tough. one I think back to a lot because it just it helped you appreciate kind of like that, you know, that yeah. more... you know, what's going on underneath the covers and, and yeah, I, I mean, this is kind of later in life, but yeah, I was an electrical engineer as well. Computer science. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, so what is the next, yeah. What is the next big thing that I guess happens after this entrepreneurial, you know, <laughs> venture, what, uh, you know, in terms of like things that you remember that are maybe relevant to stuff you're doing. Now? Oh yeah. So miracle mail outs, my first foray into, into software. Um, ironically after that, I think computers got upgraded. Right, they became more of like what you're saying. Like it's more abstracted. They became more user friendly. I think the next computer I got was a, a still a Commodore, an Amiga, and um, that computer started to introduce kind of the nice user interface. You never had to see any commands to type and launch apps. And ironically, that actually pulled me away from programming. I actually started programming less because it was actually harder to program. In order for you to get something on screen, it became harder because you need to know all the frameworks and the SDKs to be able to put a window on screen mm. versus I can just print some text, mm. right? There wasn't that simplicity anymore to, to put something on screen and the language changed. So now instead of it being basic, it was actually C. Mm. So I'd have to learn a more complex language, which I started to do and I was kind of interested in. But for the most part, I said, oh, this is interesting and fun to be able to use the computer as opposed to like program it. And a lot of the things that I might have needed, I didn't have a need to build stuff anymore because it actually had databases, it had word processors. So admittedly, I think this is uh, an interesting 
kind of dichotomy in the sense that we have better computers. It, we do have more people that are developing and programming, but I'm wondering who are the people out there that might have gotten more interested into development if it was almost forced on them because the computers in order to use gave you a taste of development in the sense that like that old Commodore, in order for me to load a program, I had to write what looked like a short line of code. And it sparked that interest in my head of what is that line of code? Whereas the barrier to entry is easy to build a fairly complex app now. It's, it's a low barrier to entry to build a very complex app. However, it's a big barrier to entry to do even the smallest thing, right? Whereas it's not in front of you. Now you actually have to go to a terminal on your, like I, I have a Mac. To the average user, they don't even know there is a terminal. Where is the terminal? Right? Like, I used it yesterday I, and then, for the first time in forever. But yeah, yeah. Forever, I, right? I, I, where, yeah. where is the terminal? It's not sitting yeah. in front of you. And if you wanted to write the most basic piece of code, uh, like a hello world, it's not in the computer. You have to go and like download Xcode you know, and then actually put environment or download node. And uh, so there's, there's low barrier entry for a technical person, very high barrier entry for a non-technical person. And it possibly actually, you know, has prevented some people from going into development at a really early time frame. Although I think once they go to college and then there's, there's YouTube videos and, you know, and there's so much available for people to get into it. It's, it's a different kind of barrier. It's a, it's a definite switch from what it looked mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. and felt like in the early days. So what, I guess what was kind of the next big thing that then happened in terms of your, your story um, in terms of like, I don't know whether like be entrepreneurial yeah. or like kind of technological insights uh, that eventually led you to, led you to, you know, study engineering. Um, so I think that I knew from, from that point on that I was going to go into the software and computers and whatnot. Um, and, uh, the kind of decision to go into that was clear from the, I think probably in high school In high school, I was just your conventional high school kid. I didn't actually didn't take any programming classes in high school. Um, I just did all stuff on the side on my own, but, um, in college went to Berkeley studied, you know, electrical engineering, computer science graduated, went into Silicon Valley right off the bat. I went right into a graphics company and graphics is what really, really fascinated me. I think the class I took, um, that was just your basic graphics class in college felt like going and learning magic tricks from a magician is what it felt <laughs> like to me because like databases, it seems simple. You have data, you store it, right? You need to search for it. You grab it, right? Uh, even networking seems straightforward. There's some bits and bytes. You put it on the network, something else picks it up. Mm. Right there, it was, it could be very complex, but you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel of a lot of software. When it came to graphics, before learning it and taking a class on it, I had no clue. How do you put these images on screen and rotate them and zoom in and out and have this camera that has different views of this virtual world? That to me was practically magic. I had no clue how all that worked. And then after a semester of one graphics class, it felt like this aha moment. Oh my gosh, it's this math and trigonometry and you know physics uh, calculations. And suddenly there was a purpose in certain classes that I took, like especially math. Math is always one of those classes kids go like, why, why do I need to learn these things? Mm. And <clears throat> graphics gave it a purpose. Like that was like, a really, really key part to the point where I, I near failed everything else in, in college because <laughs> I went and, I went and really, really went full speed on the, on this graphics class where I, I built a game. Um, I loved, Tron, who remembers Tron from the 80s and actually, you know, the reboot that they did, uh, what about a decade ago, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Tron was eye opening for me. And so we built a Tron game in a class where instead of light cycles going straight on a flat ground, it would go up a cube and can go kind of on the, on the roof of a, crew, a cube and we made it networked so people could play against each other inside of the lab. And I remember demo day came and everyone was demoing their graphics project. Um, and we demoed ours and it was networked multiplayer and the, and the instructor teacher just said, move aside. He wanted to play and everyone just started playing the game. Right. And so that was just like so much joy and just amazement at how um, you can build something that other people enjoy and interact with that are, you know, even though that instructor was technical, he wasn't enjoying the technical aspect of it. It was the gaming aspect of it. So gaming and graphics was my true love. And hence why I went into that right after college, I worked for a now defunct company, um, chromatic research. It was acquired by actually ATI, which is a Canadian uh, company um, acquired by AMD. So they were acquired by ATI. Um, I worked there briefly and then went on to NVIDIA after a few months after college. And that was actually my big stint in Silicon Valley working in tech, where I feel like I learned a lot of the skills that I have today was primarily from NVIDIA and worked with insanely smart, awesome people that helped elevate 
you know, the stuff I know and my ability to do engineering for probably like seven, eight years um, during that time there. Cool. Cool. So fascinating. Okay. So interesting. And by the way, yeah, I do know ATI. I, I drove by their office for almost eight years. I think they have really? up in Markham. Yeah. Yeah. I work yeah. for a, like a robotics company um, down here. Nice. Yeah. There were, there were, there were always the, the leapfrog battle competitor to NVIDIA during the time that I was over there. Mm. Um, they had acquired the company I originally worked for, but then I obviously was at NVIDIA at the time. So um, yeah, they, they built some great stuff and it was always a, a little slug fest, uh, the green versus the red in, in the world of graphics cards and graphics chips. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So then, then what, what then, what then what's, uh, and then what year are we in now, by the way, in terms yeah, of so like, college, I graduated, uh, graduated college in 1998 ish mm -hmm. timeline. So I was working for NVIDIA through about 2004, five, 2004, 2005. So well, six, seven years, probably more like seven. Um, and what this was then came the kind of the big turning point in life, right? This is where things really had to switch. I came down with the classic software developer engineer syndrome of repetitive strain, tendonitis, um, carpal tunnel, all, all the above. And, you know, I was a workaholic. I really loved what I did there. You know, mm. I, I, I loved software. I loved engineering. You could see me there on weekends, late nights and whatnot. I'm kind of a, an addict to technology, admittedly to this day. And um, that just, that unfortunately forced me to leave. I had everything go wrong from wrists to, here's a little funny story. I was still so determined to kind of do the work that I did that at one point I, you know, you had those wrist braces that the doctors recommend and I put pens on them. And so I could type on the keyboard this way versus this way. <laughs> and instead of clicking on a mouse, I put an early Apple mouse, like Apple is one of the first mice to come out with a mouse where the whole thing is clickable. You don't have buttons on it. So I put a mouse on the floor and I was stepping on it with my foot until my ankle started to hurt. So I was like, ah, I want to do this. I want to build. I love building. Um, but then I just broke down. Like I, I wrecked myself um, and I just had to leave engineering and I completely left it for, you know, several years. I took a bunch of time off, a couple, a couple years off. And one of the aha moments was realizing that, you know, when I came across these injuries, I was kind of recommended to go down to traditional paths. And you know, I got sent to a doctor, um, sent to neurologist and whatnot. And everything they recommended did nothing. Like there was no recovery from anything they recommended. It was just cortisone shots and patches, um, you name it, and wristbands. And no one said, okay, we'll do these exercises. No one said, take these breaks. Um, no one said strengthening, stretching and whatnot. It was just come visit. Let's see what's wrong. Okay. Boom. Uh, shot here, you know, take, take some ibuprofen and obviously it doesn't work. I think we know better today, but that was conventional medicine then. And what ironically helped was how this is a, a weird, a weird situation, but I went to go see, trying to remember the exact storyline. I went to go see, I think a chiropractor, um, for a different issue. Um, and he started to look at, you know, the, the issues involved and then started to treat me in a different way. And so it now lent itself towards the, yes, take, take a break, strengthen, stretch, um, diet even. And a massage therapist one day said, you should also try, you know, climbing, which was a strengthening technique, which I said, Oh my God, how in the world can I climb? My wrists are wrecked. I was, don't do it yet. You know, you're kind of still in acute phase, but give it some time. At some point, things will kind of mellow down. And they did. They mellowed down to the point where I wasn't hurting every day, but I couldn't use a computer. I could barely use a remote control. Um, I could barely use my phone. Back then there were candy, candy bar phones with the hard buttons, no touch phones at the time. All right. This was uh, mid two thousands before the, the iPhone came out mm. and that that massage therapist said, yeah, try climbing. So at that point I tried it and oh my God, nearly the next day, like instantly I felt stronger and better. Right. And <laughs> it, it wasn't like I'm cured, but this is the right path. And I started actually um, doing that more often. And uh, my career was completely out of engineering. I was actually working in small business. I actually worked at a restaurant. I was cooking, I was managing and whatnot, just staying away from like engineering as a whole. Um, and the climbing was what actually really helped. I started to see um, good improvement. And that's when I started to believe in kind of alternate, uh, alternate methods of healthcare. 
And I started deep diving into, in, in, into researching that. And admittedly, we're in a world, and this is what really pains me about uh, COVID. And people will hate this opinion that I have, but I'm kind of a anti-big pharma guy. Like I've hated big pharma for quite some time and traditional Western medicine, because I think it's very money driven. And it's, hey, here's the quick cure as opposed to here's the lifestyle to prevent the problems in the first place. Um, and the quick cure for what I had, you know, in my wrist, none of it worked, but the lifestyle changes did, right? You got to, you just have patience, do it slow, um, uh, lay a good foundation in, in, in health. And you can hopefully eliminate a lot of the problems that the pills and the operations and surgery would be recommended for. And so that, that I think was an eye opening period. Um, and it also created what I call is kind of the, the first uh, red pill moment. You know, people talk about crypto and taking the red pill and uh, realizing that the world that they live in isn't the truth. It's not how things should work. Well, health is the first piece of that for me. You know, it wasn't financial, it wasn't um, you know, crypto and Bitcoin. It was, it was health, doctors, big pharma. Um, yeah, that was, and that was once again, like in the, the, the mid 2000s to kind of late 2000s when I worked in small business. So that was a huge part of my life and a, a big change for me. So, uh, so fascinating. Uh, such an interesting story, uh, Paul. And, and, and something that I think is probably very relatable for a lot of people. Uh, like I think carpal tunnel is something that I'm convinced with the number of people that are on computers and just mm. given the mechanics of the problem, um, oh, yeah. I'd be surprised that if people just don't know it's called that and that they're actually experiencing an issue even because I yeah. struggled with it for many, many years. Um, so oh, okay. 100% agree with you as well that that I think, oh, I've never thought of rock climbing. Like that is, uh, that's on my list now. I got to learn how to rock climb because yeah. that just sounds uh, like- Warren. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's all, it was awesome. Um, before yeah. one though, it's not something to do when you're acute, like when you have like notable course, like nerve pain and it's sharp. It's it. Um, it's when you're in that strengthening phase where things are kind of mellowed out a little bit, but you still can't do your normal work. Then yeah. Kind of start the strengthening, and that's when climbing was amazing for me. And I, that was my career. Actually, I was a climbing instructor at a gym for a few years. So cool. Um, <laughs> surrounded by a lot of health nuts and yoga instructors. Interesting. Um, you know, natural eaters, outdoor life. It was great, and, and admittedly. You know, I would have, I would still be in that world if it wasn't for crypto. Interesting, interesting. I, in fact, I was going to say is yoga is one one thing that I I mm -hmm. lean on. Um, and uh, nice. and and also, oh yeah, just like okay, so a mouse that's shaped, <laughs> you know, because because like, what happens like is hand. like like look when you're like this, um, it's like a little awkward this, and rotated. This, this this whatever thing like literally rubs on the other one you know what i mean yeah no the, like the this, ergonomics is a little bit awkward yeah if you're like this like then you literally i don't know i found like mouse i mean all the things you mentioned 100 percent um but like obviously changing my mouse helped um and then yeah. there's like these two really simple exercises like there's this one where you just literally go like this i don't know if you do it now but you oh, look yeah. the other way like you look the other way and you stretch oh like yeah this. that feels good it's a nerve flossing kind of thing like hello I, I hold that for 30 seconds like you feel like great. it feels so good and the other one is where you kind of like you you like uh you feed your thumb and then you like you kind of like yeah and you point it down like that oh for the top nerve yeah yeah so the there's radial. like these there's like three or four or five which i think i found on youtube that i just started mm -hmm. doing as well and i because i thought i thought it was over for me at one point i was like there's no way i can like i have so much to type and i have you know so little yeah, ability yeah. at this point but 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 definitely a big fan so anyway so forget forget my story because so, so you had <laughs> this like eye-opening um kind of experience with health and your relationship yeah. with it and and then and then you you got into rock climbing um and then then what 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 after this this whole kind of period of your life so yeah rock climbing i was an instructor that's when i moved here to san diego from the bay area yeah um, a, little, a little bit before that also kind of relevant to eye-opening experience was working in the service sector i i managed and oh, kind of co-owned a restaurant in the bay area in san francisco actually in san francisco and it was both a restaurant and a nightclub and so if anyone has ever worked in the nightclub industry, you realize that a lot of cash goes through uh, a business like a nightclub or a bar or restaurant and whatnot. And spending my Mondays, which is the one day that that's closed, counting wads of wet cash was 
very eye-opening to the point you realize, my God, the fees that credit card companies charge while they're massive, they can, they can keep charging because cash is so horrifically inconvenient. It's just such a burden to count wet, somebody's $1 bills because they're like their tips and whatnot. Um, and realizing as well, even the fees that you pay normally, like the two to 3%, three to 4% aren't even all that you pay. In a dark nightclub environment, someone's handing you a credit card, you're looking at an ID, it's a little blurry. Easily another several percent we would get in chargebacks, just invalid credit cards. That happened just every month. And you just realize it was the cost of doing business, right? 3% fee, maybe another 3% in chargebacks, and that's just the cost. And somehow you just get milked on that because cash is such a pain in the ass, both for the person using it as well as for the business. And that's why these companies have so much leverage on merchants. Like right? digital payments kind of is the future on from the viewpoint of convenience. And that kind of beg the question, God, is there a, a better system at that at that point in time in my life? I said, God, is there no better system? Um, because we're we're kind of we're getting reaped both ways. But I just have to, you know, from my viewpoint of my own sanity, I'll take the fees. I'll take the fees, I'll take the charge back with credit cards because it was just too inconvenient to deal with with cash. We still accepted it, but I personally prefer not. Like I said, hey, let's try to drive people away from it. <clears throat> interesting, interesting. Okay, so and then and I assume that also um, I mean, you strike me as someone who's really good with people, like uh, you, you seem very relatable and, 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 and I assume running a business like that, you've got to be um, dealing with oh, people. Oh, it was tough. Oh, it <laughs> like, was tough. That's probably, that was yeah, probably yeah, the yeah, toughest, yeah, yeah. you know, management of people I've ever had in my entire life is working with people in my entire life. The restaurant uh, business was hard. And in fact, actually, in retrospect, I don't know if it fit me very well, uh, at least at the management level. I had a, a good time. It was fun, but it was tough. Um, uh, not sure I would... I would go back to that unless it was me kind of not on the day-to-day -day operational basis, but more, Hey, I want to see a cafe in this neighborhood. Maybe I'll fund it kind of thing, you know, um, but not really manage that kind of a business. Cool. So, and then what year are we in now? We're in like 2000 something. Yeah. Late 2000s. Um, when I was working in the restaurant business, I think that ended in 2008 in the big, big, big tank market tank of 2008. Mm. I actually left, I left San Francisco just a little bit before that. And, you know, the restaurant I was working at was still functional within a year they had tanked. Um, so they were gone. Um, unfortunately, cause you know, they're rated like top 10 new restaurant and top 100 every year, but that was gone. So going into 2009 I moved here to San Diego, looking to continue into the small business world. I was really heavy into climbing at that time, wanting to make a business out of it, even thinking of making a startup in the space, you know, I was thinking about, oh, mobile phones, mobile apps, um, mapping software, trail hiking software, that kind of stuff. It was crossing my mind, but I wasn't a developer. I didn't know the technology. I had to network and find people. Now, I, I wasn't from San Diego, so I didn't know that many people. Um, but uh, that was then a few years of, as I'd mentioned, working in the gym and uh, still reinforcing some of that belief in uh, kind of the, both the financial impact that small businesses deal with. At this time, PCI compliance was another thing that I had had dealt with. For anyone that's working small business, if you've ever had to fill out a PCI compliance form for credit card processing, you realize how just dumb and, and useless PCI compliance is. It's about a three to 500 qu uh, question form that you have to fill out. And for the average small business, you'll have to say NA as a non-applicable or we cannot pass this question we can't actually comply otherwise it would put our business we'd, we'd go out of business we wouldn't be able to function as a company so out of those 300 questions maybe 150 to 200 we didn't pass but that still passes meaning we submit it and they say okay all right what is that is that how it works they're like yeah the thing is if one of those 200 questions ever becomes an issue in the future like someone has a credit card um stolen and invalid charges and you didn't comply to one of those questions, then now you're liable. So you're PCI compliant in the sense that you've passed, but here are the things that would cause you to be liable in the future if an issue ever arose. That's how it worked. And it took weeks and weeks of figuring out what all these questions meant and filling them out and multiple phone calls with the compliance agency for us to basically say, well, we can't comply to two thirds of what you're asking. That, that's the world we live in. And that was another eye-opening aspect of like, there's got to be something better than this. 
there's got to be something better than this. Yeah, so, something better than this. <laughs> so late 2000s. So has has Bitcoin? It hasn't come across your radar just yet. Uh, but are hasn't you exploring? Yet. Are you having questions about other aspects of money as well at this point, or not really? Uh, money itself, not so much. You know, I, I was in a bit of the stock market and trading. Um, this is now coming into 2012, 2013, and I, you know, I had some shares from when I worked at Nvidia. I diversified. Um, I was trading. I was following a financial blogger. Uh, Cody Woolard, I think was his name. And he was one of those like, kind of anti Wall Street, you know, the zig when they zag kind of guys. Um, he also, you know, held shares in NVIDIA. That was one of his big portfolio companies. Um, and then one day he just said, Bitcoin. He's like, I'm going to put some Bitcoin in the portfolio. He didn't say how much. He didn't say what it was. He didn't say how to get it. He just said, Bitcoin. I'm like, what the hell is that? So here I am going to my e trade account, look up Bitcoin. Nothing shows up. Like, Hell is this? You know, so I got to search the web. You know, Google. This is now mid mid twenty thirteen. It was post the early twenty thirteen bull run up to two hundred. So yeah, post Bitcoin, had, post that. So it was like when it tanked about a hundred after the two sixty or two thirty. If you remember, yeah. like March April of twenty thirteen, it yeah, yeah, spiked yeah. up and then it tanked. And I think in that tank was when I had heard about it, like in the hundred dollar range. Um, and so I started looking it up and I went, wow this is amazing stuff. You know, the white paper and all the pod, all the, all the podcasts, all two different podcasts at the time um, that were available. Let's talk Bitcoin with Andreas. Um, uh, that was kind of the anchor of me learning about, about Bitcoin and how it worked. And I remember driving to work, driving to the gym almost every day, listening to a podcast episode because I was you know, 50 episodes behind or something and just sitting in the parking lot. <laughs> Like listening, what well, coworkers would drive up next to me, you know, park, wave hi, go into work, and I'm still listening, wanting to finish that episode. And then they come back to get something out of the car and they look at me like, why are you still in the car? <laughs> you know, like, oh, because I'm listening to this. And I think at that point, hopefully no one from the that company is listening right now, but I'm pretty sure I became like the worst employee because that's all I did. Like I just always had a podcast in, in the back of my mind while I was on while I was working there, I was able to use a computer by then. I was, you know, moderately, but not not software engineering, and uh, I I couldn't focus on anything else. That's all I did. And I started looking for the meetup groups, and there was a meetup group here in San Diego. Started networking with people. hadn't gone to a conference yet, um, but then you know just started using the technology. I thought this was fascinating. I felt like this was what kind of connected the dots for me, both from the payment small business side, you know, having dealt with cash, weird, stupid PCI compliance, as well as this realization that the world is you know, obviously revolves around money and money is in the hands of the few and those few control what the reality is. They, they bend reality to what they deem um, is beneficial for them, such as the, the pharmaceutical medical world. They're very, very close ties to government. Government controls the money um, and their ability to say, this is what is real is hinged on financial resources. And I felt like I wanted to see that flatten. You know, it's never gonna be not a pyramid, right? Like, it, there's always gonna be people at the top, people that think that crypto and, and other technologies, you know, DeFi and whatnot, are gonna make everyone fully peer to peer are completely mistaken. I think there's always gonna be a pyramid. And it's now about slowly kind of flattening it, mm. and giving people more access and removing kind of that separation of government and money, um, removing, them from being able to decide what reality is like what kind of food gets that's classified as fda approved what kind of drugs get classified as fda approved um that all ties together for me and that's why it was the aha moment you know when i discovered bitcoin and i couldn't do anything else he's got obsessed wait i have a question what were you doing at nvidia again what was your kind of your yeah, so NVIDIA, I was a 3D software engineer. I wrote graphics drivers. I debugged games, debugged CAD programs that were running on our hardware. Um, you know, interfaced a lot with the hardware engineers to help design, you know, functionality and feature sets in the next generation. Oh, of right. Hardware. But then after Carpal Tunnel hit, you said you kind of moved away from I all moved that completely. completely. Like, like that's completely. crazy. So you just like yeah. let it go. Hey, just quick, yeah. one quick question: Did you ever experiment with like I don't know, like voice, uh, just like be you oh know, yeah instead of your toes? <laughs> Yep. So uh, when I say I broke down, I broke down completely. So the moment I left it, the, the, the time when I had left NVIDIA where I kind of like had the last straw was because I actually strained my voice from voice recognition. So I had, oh, wow. an, anch had, a, had an ankle that Crazy. was hurting. So you're like mouse. a workaholic, workaholic. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, for sure. No question about it. Like I wrecked, I wrecked everything left and right. Um, that is so crazy. That's why I couldn't even go into meetings anymore. It's like my voice was wrecked. And so it took about eight months for my voice to recover. This was around the 2004, 2005 timeframe, about eight months where I just didn't talk to people. I had to go to a speech pathologist to give me these exercises to kind of recover. And um, they, they definitely helped. And so I'm, you know, notably better. I don't really have any voice issues anymore. I still use dictation like today, cause you know, my wrists aren't 100% recovered. Mm. I still use dictation, but I'm not trying to use dictation to code, which I literally tried to do it in video. It's like, if space open parentheses, um, you know, X equals, and, and that's like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> it's terrible. Cause it's not natural. It's not natural to like read code. It's natural to, right. you know, say a sentence and paragraph right, and whatnot. Right, right. So I don't really have any issues with dictation today, but, and plus dictation software was terrible then it was, you know, it just wasn't as friendly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I had to ask. Okay. Yeah. So you definitely, no, I'm glad you that. asked. Cause like, I didn't, I didn't complete the picture of how wrecked I made myself back then. Oh and how much my of a, goodness. Kind of a, a tech workaholic addict I was back then. And okay. So, so, so no, slam. I was just curious. I asked, I want to ask that because, um, because you were talking about, you know, how like you got so deep into like the white paper and Bitcoin. And so like all that was kind of coming back to you, like, like that six cents movie, right. Where you're just like, like yeah, all the codes exactly. and the ones and like, zeros from when you're a kid and you're just I like, did. Oh I mean, my Lord. No I was noticed better at the and... time. So yeah, no, I was, I was, uh, I could read it and I could understand it because I had technology at heart, but it had been, mm. you know, I discovered Bitcoin 2013 and I hadn't been a developer since 20, uh, or 2005. Mm -hmm, so it's been mm -hmm. like eight years since I was a developer. Maybe yeah. I wrote a few like Excel macros for, you know, business management and whatnot, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. scheduling, but I hadn't like heavy coded and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it still was, yeah, it, it'd been a while, but some stuff was still fresh in my head. Like I could understand the white paper. I could understand the technology. I can install you know, these early applications and, and early wallets and use them. Um, and actually there was an interesting moment where, you know, in the meetup, you know, we had a monthly meetup for Bitcoin, sometimes weekly in, in San Diego? and I decided to give a demo in San Diego. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, this was in 2013 and I decided to do a demo of, I think at mm -hmm. the time it was Armory. I don't know if you remember early, <laughs> 100%, um, 100%. it wasn't multi-sig, it was like multi-key uh, app called Armory that let you kind of almost cold storage uh, Bitcoin-ish, right? And I, I gave this demo to about 15 people at a restaurant and one of the meetups. And halfway through, I was asking myself, this is horrible. The experience of going to spend and the, the USB key and copy this file. Like I had been doing it at home. And I know that when I was doing it, it would always give me a little bit of cold sweats to kind of like you know, spend money. It's just like, am I doing it right? Am I going to mess something up? And as I was demoing it, it reinforced like, wow, this is, I wanted to stop the demo right in the middle and go, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I mean, demoing this application. It was, it was so, and I could see the, the look on people's eyes, like, wow, you expect us to do this to like store Bitcoin. Um, but I, I finished the demo and, and at the end I go, yeah, this is complicated. It's going to get better. And that was a moment when I decided I want to get into the space mm. and actually build something not as a developer, but as you know, an entrepreneur, right. Mm. And, and get something built, but put a team together and, you know, improve on this industry because I was fascinated. I was compelled by it. I couldn't focus at any other job that I was on at that time. Um, and so that was, that was it. So, so this is 2013, how, mid, mid 2013 or something. Then you, say, you said you want to build something and what, like, and then you're at the meetup. So you've got a bit of a, you know, you've got a bit of a community around you so you can bounce mm -hmm. these ideas off of people. So how do you, how do you now go from that, you know, idea to like, you know, eventually launching, um, you know, a business or whatever, an app or, a solution. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time there were not that many businesses in crypto. Yeah. And they kind of fell under, you know, two buckets and exchanges and wallets and miners. And there right. wasn't much else than that. And really, if you think about crypto and Bitcoin specifically, there's really only two required um, businesses, like absolutely required in order for the, the, for Bitcoin to function, it's miners and wallets. And that's it. Those are the two fundamental required things for a cryptocurrency, right? At least a, a proof of work cryptocurrency, the original one for Bitcoin. You need miners to mine it and you need a wallet because people have to be able to transact it. If they don't transact it, is it really a currency? Everything else is technically optional. It's technically optional, but realistically you need exchanges because people want to be able to get into and out of the cryptocurrency, right? That that's like connects the real world. Um, and then you need other services because people might want to lend the money, hold it, store, you know, custody it and you know, get insurance on it and all the stuff that our ecosystem is built on top of it. So uh, miners, wallets, exchanges. Um, 
I didn't want to get into the exchange game. I kept, you know, hearing of all the different challenges and the regulatory burden, um, yeah, having to wear suits and ties and interface with bankers. Uh, I was definitely not that type of person. Um, I don't deal with kind of legacy financial very well. I don't like to talk, walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, and then mining didn't really interest me. It felt so, it felt very passive. It's very critical and essential in the ecosystem, but it felt very passive in the sense that you're kind of like the back end. you don't interface with people, right? And, and having worked at NVIDIA and small business, I was interested in interfacing with people or building something that interfaced with people. And that moment of showing and demoing Armory, you know, as a product that interfaced with people and all the, the kind of UX problems it had made me say, I want to build something that interfaces with people that improves on it. And that's when, yes, I wanted to go and build at the time, you know, company and product called Airbits. So when I went and looked for the co-founders and the, the, the developers that I could eventually work with to build the company. And, and then the vision behind Airbits was to build a, uh, like a user controlled, uh, Bitcoin wallet to start with. Yeah, so it's that... simple. It was simple. Um, I definitely built. I felt very strongly about self custody. I remember that was actually one of our discussions back when we had first met. I was uh -huh. almost like um, uh, overly like self custody, own your keys, purist. Like don't use exchanges. Blah blah blah. Um, hey, 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 Paul, sorry. Do you mind person. if I? Do you mind if I just pause for one second? I just realized I have sure. my baby monitor on and it's uh, going. On. <laughs> Give me a second. Okay, sorry about that. But yeah, we're back. So yeah, on the on the Airbits note. So if you can maybe help me. So, yeah. so initially that that was kind of the thesis, right? To build a user controlled wallet. Yeah, to use a user controlled wallet, but to abstract away, uh, much like computers had done for many years, like that load command I had to put into my Commodore to load an app and the command line and whatnot, abstract away the security of a private key, mm. right? And dealing with private keys. Because I, I noticed the 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 contradiction in the custodial model versus the self-custody model and the challenges of, of both. And I wanted to build self-custody that felt as simple or as close to as simple as a custodial model. At the time in crypto, the two biggest and most visible companies, you know, one of them still at this way today, um, Blockchain Not Info and Coinbase. And they had that obviously separate uh, security model, like self-custody versus custodial. Um, they, they were kind of at odds in the sense that that actually caused a rift between the two companies and the two founders at, at an early point in time. And I wanted to be able to really come and build the experience that Coinbase was building, but with the ownership, self-custody, and an even improved privacy model on what uh, blockchain.info was building. And I was inspired by some technology that I'd seen um, in just general tooling, um, uh, bit torrent synchronization, encryption. I felt I could be used or some technology similar that used to you know encrypt and backup and synchronize keys in a way that users just feel like they're logging into an account and it would be a you know a, you know conventional mobile bitcoin wallet but it would be focused at that time around payments i was really a fan of of bitcoin as a payment mechanism you know merchant adoption and i know that the bitcoiners out there are going to be like oh that's terrible you shouldn't be spending your bitcoin and blah blah, blah and that whole debate and whatnot well i'm sorry it's i i like it being used yes i hold it and i do have a lot of it you know a lot of it that i don't touch like just it's just sitting there but i want to be able to use it and that was what inspired me it's what i did before i formed the company in these meetups i'd want them at like restaurants and cafes i would accept bitcoin and we would pay them in bitcoin and so admittedly, a little, a little of me is lost as uh, a little, a little bit of that love was lost in that era from that era. Um, but I'm still passionate about what it, what it can do. So Airbus was that it was focused on the had a built-in merchant directory. That's what we launched first. Um, but the UX of, yeah, not having to see a private key, but you still fully own it as a company. We never see it. We don't have access to it. That was where I was focused around. And that's what we had built at the time. And I think it you know, resonated with a lot of people. A lot of people said, hey, this is a much easier tool to onboard other new users than kind of the conventional write down 12 words and put it on a piece of paper or a safe, and that kind of thing. And that was our focus. Uh yeah, so actually, um, you know, a lot of people probably don't know, but like before before we started Unocoin, we 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 uh, you know tried to take a, a sci a experimental scientific approach, if you will. <laughs> we tried to have, you know, many ideas and tried to iterate, and and one of our early ideas was actually something called Uno Wallet. Uh, I don't think it's oh, okay. around anymore, but it was, <laughs> you know, it was essentially this like, remember Insta Wallet? 
Uh, maybe they were that, custodial maybe that came wallet. before 2013. I think it was like 2011, 2012. I think, I think was, I remember. I think they were. Uh, I think they, they were shut down and they got hacked. Didn't they? I think they were a custodial, custodial but their wallet. whole like kind of pitch was, you go to their website, and like the website that you're seeing, like the URL mm-hmm. was like um, your key. <laughs> Kind of, kind of. I think it was. Yeah, something like correctly. that. Exactly. You are. So okay. if you lost that URL, you would lose your funds, but you'd Good have one. to get access to to that. Yep. And and I remember we were kind of playing around with that idea, but but where the user would actually have the private keys on their side. Um, right. Right. And and but but, but anyways, my, my reason for bringing this up was is that it, it it you know a business you know at one point or another also maybe it doesn't need to make money nowadays, but it, it, it kind of needs to generate revenue. And so that was where yeah. we always kind of got stuck was we were like, this is obviously the way that, you know, the future is going to be, but like, you know, like you can't, like, what are you, what are you going to do after that? Like type of deal. And so I'm just curious. So like, did you ever think about that? Or were you more just like, look, look, we'll figure that out yeah. later. Let's just solve this problem. Like curious kind of yeah. what your thinking was around that. No, we for sure had that in mind. And that's what I pitched to several investors to be able to bootstrap the company. And the the thought was, especially at the time when Bitcoin was you know, relatively cheap to transact, was that we had a business model twofold. Number one, the merchant directory, getting premium listings, get merchants that bubble up to the top, you know, kind of like a Yelp model, all right, but focused around Bitcoin. That was a business model we thought would have at least a, a few years of, of shelf life until like the Yelps just came in and took over. Right. So there would be some shelf life there is what our, what, our, what our thought was. But as well, just simply, you know, people are already paying mining fees to be able to transact in Bitcoin. What if that was increased by a really small amount and then some amount of that was paid to us as well? If you provide a, a, a good product, the theory being, hell, people will pay for it. The same sense that, yeah, you, everyone can rip music for free off the internet. But if you provide a good product interface, customer support, and you charge a little bit for it, people will pay for it. And... That was the original thought. And we actually baked in some code to do that. We just never turned it on, right? Because fees became um, pretty high. People were very sensitive to them. And plus, we also started to develop a secondary business model um, that has worked for us since. So we were easily the very, very first company ever in the crypto space to incorporate exchange functionality into a wallet. And um, I saw that not too long after we launched Airbits because I realized that one of my biggest pain points was I didn't want to hold money in a custodial exchange. And that was what everyone online was saying, go buy an exchange, transfer the wallet, go buy an exchange, transfer a wallet. And I was like, why don't we just put them both together? How hard is that? All right, talk to the API of an exchange, KYC, purchase, purchase Bitcoin, and then just have the exchange send it out. Mm. Why should I have to do all of those steps? And at the time, you probably know this person pretty well. Um, I was good friends with uh, David Ripley from Glidera. Um, and of course, yeah. their, their product at the time was focused around kind of being almost like a Coinbase competitor, but multi-sig with a kind of weird multi-sig wallet. Mm-hmm. And um, we started talking and I said, hey, here's a pain point, something I think that you know people would like and want. And he's like, huh. And they started building it, basically an API to allow wallets to purchase Bitcoin and have it automatically sent to a self-custody solution. Um, and we were the first to integrate that early on, back when... Like, the API was in pre pre beta alpha and we demoed it um, in Silicon Valley at uh, an accelerator where we went to uh, plug and play. Um, and that actually became the future of our company as far as our monetization model. Many others followed suit to that. And there weren't as many companies that offered such a, uh, a solution at the time. But I feel like, you know, although many people don't know, we pioneered that idea, you know, Gladera and Airbits at the time pioneered that idea, which now many wallets do. Um, but we had it first and foremost. Um, and so that's, you know, we started integrating a few more partners before we started migrating over into Edge. But you know, the old code base did have a few exchanges integrated at that time. And Paul, I, I think I've already shared with you as well, right, that, uh, that UnoCoin had plugged in and did an integration with blockchain.com. Or dot, dot yeah, I remember info. that. Yeah, I mean, we were um, talking. You're still with Unicoin, and we were talking about a potential integration. I think you guys, yeah, thought, yeah, um, we were able to land, which is huge. Side. Obviously, there's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so that, that I mean, that, that I mean, I bring it up because, uh, and you know, I've talked to you know, I know Anthony, and so we've uh, talked to them about you know doing something mm-hmm. similar, and and you know, things kind of right. went sideways in India for a while, but now with things yeah, yeah. up again, 
Um, yeah. So anyway, so, so I'm definitely a big fan of that, right? That that vision of being able to settle directly to someone's, you know, wallet. In fact, just this morning, I was like uh, tweeting about cold card and, and I'm a big right. fan of Rodolfo and these guys. Um, okay. So I guess, so where does your story take you next in terms of like, so Airbits, uh, because yeah. at one point you guys changed your name to edge but like curious yeah like what did that like, what was the look reasoning like? behind it and so edge yeah, now yeah. right you know is what we are yeah, today yeah. and so what motivated the change to edge so mm. we we did have the fundamental realization that heck what what separates airbits is that security model that security model of being able to take keys automatically encrypt them automatically back them up synchronize between devices all the user has is their login credentials pin biometric that kind of thing um and we saw with the advent of the DAP ecosystem, a need for that for other apps, right? So there were all these DAPs that we're trying to build early on. This is like before MetaMask and whatnot. The DAP ecosystem was riddled with different key management solutions for each DAP. Like somewhere, you know, it creates a key. I have this great screenshot from an early version of Augur that, um, in, for you to create your Augur account, which is just basically your wallet keys, you would enter a password and it would give you your username. That's what they would claim. Here's your username. The username was about a 256 character blob of random text, quote unquote, your username. That basically was your encrypted private key and your password was decrypting it. But you would have to save off this 256 bit giant blob of text as your username, you know, hopefully in like a password manager, if you had one installed, if you didn't, then it's like, well, how might, what the hell do I do with this thing? Right. And then when you wanted to log in, you would enter that and you enter your password, decrypt it. And there's your private key. Um, and so we got into the conversation of, huh, you know, how do you like think the way edge works? We could possibly build that in such a way that it's a library that, you know, web-based JavaScript library that can go into other applications. And then they're like, wow, this is great, blah, blah, blah. So we had started to take the code base we had, which was in C++ for you technical folks out there and started to rewrite a portion of it, just the key management part of it in JavaScript so it can run on the web. And admittedly, it was just refreshing to, to code in a more modern language, right? To our developers like, oh my God, it's so much easier to deal with a modern language versus kind of C++, a very low level language. Um, and then we started asking ourselves, you know, this is also given that dApps are primarily focused on Ethereum. We started asking ourselves, well, how would we build Ethereum support into Airbits? You know, well, you know, it's not a lot of like C++ libraries for different cryptocurrencies. And so, well, maybe we start building the core of our wallet because our wallet had UI and then a core. We start building the core of the wallet in JavaScript and extend upon this work that we already did uh, to build a library for dApps. So it started to grow from there. From the no nomenclature point of view, from the name of the company point of view, we were calling this library, this, this little library that does key management for other apps. We're calling this library our Edge Security SDK or the Edge SDK. And Edge Security came about from a side convo I was having with another entrepreneur who was in the IoT space. And I was telling him what the security model was. He said, you know what I need? I need, I need Edge Security. You know, I go, what does that mean? And, and it, take, it borrows the terminology from like edge computing, right? Computing at the edges of the network, not in the, the central servers, but on these edge devices. And I'm like, huh, I really like that term, edge computing, edge security. And I said, well, I don't think what we're building is for your IoT devices. The term resonated in the sense that what we're doing is a fundamental shift in the security model of data. It's taking data and as opposed to securing it in the central hubs, in the big monolithic central hubs, we're securing the data at the edges of the network. And at the very edges of the network, you got go from the center and then you've got like, you know, the <clears throat> periphery computers and network uh, uh, attached storage. And then at the very edges are people. People are the outermost edges of, of a network. And we're securing data on their devices with them in their pocket. That's what our technology at Airbits did. So we were calling that edge SDK, the edge security SDK. It's the edge security model. We started branding around that terminology, edge security as a whole. And when we started rewriting the, the core of the wallet in JavaScript for the dApps and adding support for the cryptos, we said, well, we want to launch a new version of Airbits that now supports other cryptocurrencies using this new library. But it being in such a fundamentally different code base, we would have to build another app around it. 
And you know how it is to rebuild an app. I'm not sure if you've ever had it worked in a company where you took your entire code base and rewrote it from scratch. Mm -hmm. That rarely happens. That <laughs> rarely happens. And it rarely happens at a startup. Um, so much so that most attempts at doing that have tanked the company that tried. Like it's littered with a history of companies that have tanked because they decided to rewrite their entire code base from scratch. Usually you incrementally do it. We, we decided to do it, rewrite it all from scratch in JavaScript. And we knew we wouldn't have all of the features that Airbits had. So we decided to launch a second app. And then we said, what are we going to call it? Like, what's the app going to be called? Will we call it Airbits 2.0? You know, like Jax rewrote their app and called it Jax Liberty. And like, do we call it like Airbits something or whatnot? And then we said, well, it's using this security model. Like we've already branded the security model of edge security. What do we call it? edge? Simple as that. Like, you know, it's, and it has a story behind it. It has, it has meaning behind the term. Um, and it brings to life this concept of kind of user, user powered autonomy, right? It's, it's at the edge of the network. And so we really resonated with that. And hence that was the name change. And that occurred in 2017, like 2016, 2017. And ironically, we kind of really missed the 2017 bull run because 2017 was our building year. The entire year was Airbits going heads down and saying, let's build Edge, you know, pretty much from scratch. Like Airbits was out there, we were supporting it, but we weren't really updating it much because we knew we, was gonna get, we were going to deprecate it for Edge. Um, we saw great like new user accounts and transactions and whatnot, but it wasn't our focus. We didn't market it at all. Um, but then, yeah, we launched you know, the new app. Edge, which is a rebuild, same security architecture, same backend as Airbits, but now support for multiple currencies. You know, we had SDKs that can support Ethereum and other currencies, you know, Monero, um, XRP and whatnot. Um, and that launched in early 2018. And that's kind of the beginnings of where we are today, but carries over a lot from Airbits. Number one, the security model. But number two, the thing that I'd mentioned we pioneered, which was the integration of exchange and wallet in one. So we like to call it an exchange wallet, right? It's a wallet, but its purpose is exchange functionality. And that's where you know we started with Edge. Right from the get-go, we had exchange functionality. And at this day, I think we have the most amount of exchange of functionality of any app. Interesting, interesting. And and, and, and how, like where, like if people are hearing this, where can they actually use your, maybe just, just to sum up also, like so, so mm -hmm. Edge is essentially a Bitcoin and crypto wallet where the user holds their own keys uh, on yep. the wallet, on the phone yep. itself, um, and, and it's not centralized. And, 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 and there are other wallets like that out there, but what makes Edge different is that you're able to now not only hold your own keys, but also uh, you know, buy more crypto or Bitcoin and sell mm -hmm. that Bitcoin or crypto. Um, and, and so you, you mentioned, uh, Ripley, I, I know that company eventually got acquired by Kraken, yep. et cetera, et cetera. So curious. So I guess what you're saying now is, is that you've reestablished kind of more direct connections maybe with some of these exchanges mm -hmm. or exactly. and, and what, where, where, how much coverage do you guys have? Is it like global? Anybody anywhere can, can easily right. just buy or can you, can, yeah, really interested. So for people, so, for, so we, we have over 16 exchange partners that facilitate, Fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat, and crypto to crypto exchange functionality. About half of them are crypto to crypto. Half of them are, you know, fiat rails to banking systems and cash. Um, we have almost global. We have obviously global coverage from the viewpoint of just sending and receiving crypto, right? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Global, right? That that's that's obvious. Um, from the viewpoint of in and out of fiat, um, some people will recognize some some familiar names that we've partnered with. Wire in the U.S. lets people buy and sell from a a bank account in the U.S. Um, we have credit card support through Simplex, which is also a very popular company within the crypto space. That's credit card purchases almost Does that, does that work in India though? Like in people in India can, does that, I'm just curious. I believe, people, it, I believe yeah. it, I believe it does. They, they cover so many countries that it's hard for us to test every single one. Mm -mm -mm. Um, Fair so enough. I believe it works in India. We actually also have support uh, for India through another partner. Mm. So that we have covered through Transac, I believe. Mm. Um, we have support for Great Britain for and I know you guys have the Apple payments. Pay thing going on in some countries. Yeah. Is that also where's that? Yep. Uh, uh, the countries uh, U.S., Europe, I believe Canada. Um, gosh, once again, our, our coverage on Apple Pay is pretty broad. That I can't remember outside of those main countries, but it's pretty broad around the world. That's through another partner, MoonPay. We were probably, I think, we were the first to launch Apple Pay support of any self custody solution, if not almost any wallet, I believe. And that was yeah, through our partnership with Moonpay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and that continues on. And we'll soon enable, uh, I think, Google Pay and Samsung Pay as well. Amazing. Um, so we have credit card support, which is only buy, unfortunately. You can't really sell in credit card. We did briefly have support for sell into a credit card with a partnership with Simplex in Europe. Um, but that's been, that's been uh, unfortunately deactivated due to some technical um, kind of hiccups in there. But uh, we have Australia support through another partner so people can buy uh, with multiple different me payment methods in Australia. Um, and gosh, more than I can think of now. Uh, people can do SEPA transfers in Europe with almost no KYC for buying. They, they mm. just specify their bank account. So it is from a bank account, but you don't provide uh, an ID, no email, no phone number, no address, just your bank account information and you can buy. Selling does require a little bit of KYC and address, no phone number, no email, just an address. Um, and so mm. yeah, quite a lot of partners. So uh, that's our goal. And we should be launching Canada very, very soon. So Beautiful. people will be able to buy, buy and sell in Canada at pretty good limits and limited KYC. Um, and that's been our goal. We do very, very heavy biz dev to partner with a lot of exchanges. Our goal is that, you know, we take kind of the model um, that, you know, financial services and exchanges are kind of a financial service and financial services, much like ISPs are rarely very global. Um, I have this analogy to the early internet. If you think of the early internet, the early internet companies were literally ISPs because everyone said, how do you make money on a web page? Just giving information out for free, right? It's just a web page. Maybe you're selling shoes. Oh, sure. Okay, great. I can kind of do that physically. Why would I want to buy shoes online? So early internet companies or ISPs are the ones that raised a lot of money. They're the ones that were kind of visible names in the industry. Um, they're the ones that connected you, but they're very regional. They covered only specific place. And one of the big things, they're also very, very um, prone to whatever the, the incumbents wanted out of you. You had to bow down to the incumbents. So you had access to their wires and, and phone lines. So the AT&Ts and the Verizons of the world, why they didn't, well, while they didn't provide internet access, you needed to go to them for permission to their wires. That's what the early internet startups were like. In contrast, the people that developed web pages sat on top of that. They were the software providers, right? The early Yahoo's and, you know, going into Google and even like not Netscape, but early software companies, they're the ones that actually extracted a, mass, a vast majority of the value long-term of the internet era, right? They were the true value extractors. And I liken that to today. Now the exchanges are currently the ones that are extracting value because they are the ISPs. They are the on and off ramps. Of crypto. That's how you get in. You need an ISP to access the internet. You need an ISP to access crypto from kind of the legacy world. Um, once you're in, who, who then provides the value? Well, the true value of crypto is its autonomous nature. It's, it's you know, difficult, if not impossible to regulate nature. It's global accessibility nature. And that's the software layer, much like the web pages. And that's what we wanted to sit on. We wanted to sit on that software layer, but we needed the ISP connectivity. And we wanted the countries that could specialize in those regions, were good at that in those different regions, to, to focus on that as their strength. And we focus on the self-custody software part as our strength, but we interface the two. So we make it a very, very strong point to steer clear of that, but try to provide that experience. Now, that's not easy. There's some challenges there. It's not going to feel as fluid as you know using a, a Coinbase or a Kraken, but I think some of those challenges of have improved over time and will continue to improve, especially as people will start to really ask for this. And I think, you know, there's, and you probably saw the big discussion of like, oh my God, they're going to, they're going to tank usability of Bitcoin and crypto, be, you know, Mnuchin uh, from, from the feds, you know, cre creating all this regulation on Bitcoin from everything I've read. I'm all for it. I don't know how many people you've heard say that, but I'm all for that regulation because it doesn't actually affect self-custody. Mm. It affects the exchanges and it, and it's the kind of regulation I've been expecting and telling people this is going to happen eventually is that, um, non self-hosted solutions are going to crumble as transactional mediums. Like you're, you're not going to transact out of, out of custodial solutions. And you're only going to want those when you want to interface with the legacy world. Otherwise you won't want to touch them. And that rings true with this new regulation being proposed. And that new regulation is saying, if you transfer out of a custodial solution, who is a financial service, a bank exchange or whatnot, you will have to prove that, you know, who owns that public key, who owns a public and private key 
when that money leaves a custodial exchange. Well, okay, great. Then I can't really transact with anyone but myself from a custodial service. So I want to keep my money in my own in my own key so that I, I can actually transact crypto. So it's actually pushing the industry where the industry should be going in the first place. And it's pushing the industry in the direction that the crypto was built for. So it doesn't mean crypto exchanges won't exist. They're still, like I said, they're a critical infrastructure. Um, they're the ISPs to onboard people, but it'll make people transact and hold their money where they control it because it'll become impossible to transact otherwise. So I, I don't think this, this, I don't think it matters actually from the viewpoint of what Mnuchin is trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid malicious intent with money and funding, you know, illicit activity. I don't think it's going to, it's going to make a dent in that at all. Right. But from the uh, viewpoint uh, of, you know, uh, regulating what you can and these exchanges and custodial solutions can be regulated. It's doing what I would expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I always, you know, worry about like uh, welcoming too much regulation, but I see where you're going with this. It, it, okay, so you're, you must be aware of FATF, right? And then the travel. Mm -hmm. And same, exactly the same so, thing. I, so I can't, maybe I'm going to butcher this, but I mean, uh, you know, I think Brian Armstrong recently talked about it. Um, this is this is something that I, I bring up actually quite often as well in my- Only the, in, only in the, the custodial exchange CEOs are talking about it, if you notice. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they have the most- they're the most impacted. Wait, it was so supposedly, um, yeah, what they are, are proposing is, is that, okay, so you're going to have to whitelist all the ex centralized exchange accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and then at least the murmurs are is that in the future, they may not allow people to move their funds from those whitelisted accounts to their self-hosted wallets. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I'm just saying it's like, so, that's yeah, and, and, kind of the, the, the if, so I'm if saying that happens, so if that happens have, it would kill exchanges. It would kill exchanges, but I'm just saying is how would people then commerce? Like, like don't, I thought you were reliant somewhat on centralized exchanges to make that eventual trade happen. So there's a viewpoint of, of edges business model. And then there's the viewpoint of just crypto as a whole. So Edge's business model of people being able to buy an exchange and send to their own self custody solution. If they were to if they were to ban sending out to a self custody key at all, even like you can't even KYC your key, then yeah, that would kind of tank us. It wouldn't tank Bitcoin. I feel like people would just hold Bitcoin and acquire it from other mechanisms, not a centralized exchange. Mm -hmm. I think number one, I think that rule is going to be very, 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 very hard for them to pass first and foremost. Because that that to me is the right. scariest and most draconian yeah, move is it, that- It's the scariest and most draconian. And I also think one that will never happen. In, yeah. in all honesty, I don't think that'll ever happen. Because, um, well, that means that you can't even get crypto into the exchange to be able to, to sell it. So, so you can't remove it. Does that mean I can't get it in mm -hmm. as well? Like I can't send in there? So then if I can't send it in and I can't remove it, then what is crypto at that point? All right. This and, is, I think, why a lot of people right. are kind of like up in arms about it is that it's not really about what they're proposing today, but it's like what is kind of coming down the line is like they're setting the framework for, you know, a difficult situation. Um, it, it is. But I think that, that the line of you need to KYC a key that you send out money is one that they could easily pass. And I foresee that happening. And mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't kill the utility of crypto because sure I'll, I'll you know we build the technology we actually do this already today for one of our partners is that when you want to buy bitcoin you sign with the private key of the address that's going to receive the money and then the exchange sends it to only that address mm -hmm. so that signature somewhat proves that you own the private key and i don't know any other way that you know this mnuchin regulation will ask you to prove that you own the private key other than via a, sig a signature so okay you sign the money is is in your keys but now you can't control where it goes after that so that I imagine them passing because it doesn't really impart a lot of friction. There's some developer friction there, but it's nothing impossible. Um, from the viewpoint of you can't send it at all, that I think you know there's enough uh, people that will uh, that will veto that and stop that in its tracks simply because there's no utility. Then, like you've completely killed off any utility of crypto. Then it's just simply. Um, yeah, it's a normal and, AC and, bank and, transfer. And, it's a wire bank transfer. But and Paul, sense. Paul, just just so like, because I mean, a lot of this is pretty nuanced, and we've been in this space for a long time, so it's easy for us to kind of yeah. um, understand it. But if you can maybe help people understand two things: one is 
technically Coinbase, for example, they have Coinbase, but then they have like the Coinbase wallet, right? Where you do technically right. hold your own wallet, hold your keys right. rather. So number one question is, is can you maybe help explain why Edge is maybe, you know, got an edge on that? I think what your answer might be is, is that you bring those two experiences together, right? You're not having the, is that, is that the answer so, there? Or So number one, Coinbase wallet has the kind of, traditional legacy way of key management. So your Coinbase account that you create with Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, the company coinbase.com, that username and password that has no correlation to the Coinbase wallet. All right, Coinbase wallet, you've got 12, 24 words that you have to write down a piece of paper, put it in a safe, don't make sure no one sees it. Like, so those are completely separate in that sense. Um, so they don't have a good integrated experience from their exchange to the wallet. They do have an integration between the two, and they've only recently added that after us having it for six years, five, five, six years, they've mm -hmm. now finally allowed someone to buy crypto into their Coinbase wallet using their Coinbase account, but from the, the actual wallet, but it's like two accounts almost. It's like you have two accounts. One is the 24 words account. And then one is your credentials into, into Coinbase. Um, second kind of core advantage, you know, with edge is that we support many different exchanges. We take not the monolithic approach, instead we partner as opposed to try to be the only one-stop shop. Kind of take like an Amazon approach, right? We're not the ones that are actually selling the goods, but we partner with a whole bunch of people that are selling the goods. Um, we think that model can succeed over time because number one, like it, it's hard to be regulated as a financial service company everywhere in the world. We don't want to do that. We'll partner with those companies instead. Um, and the the key, interesting thing about the key management is uh, we talked about the key management where it automatically encrypts your private key and backs up. You just have these credentials. Well, when we interface with other exchanges, there's sometimes our credentials to interface with them. So there's a key that you use to quote unquote log into these exchanges to be able to um, get access to the fact you've already KYC'd with them. Well, that key is also encrypted inside of Edge. So think of it as almost like an invisible password manager that you never see. You log into Edge Biometric that unlocks your keys, and then you tap to go and buy crypto, or you tap to sell with one of our partners like Wire, and you're automatically logged in because there's a key that was created and saved inside of your encrypted Edge account that quote unquote logs and, you in, and you and don't even my, know what's happening. If my app gets deleted, or if I throw my phone in the toilet or something by accident, like there's there's like the is there, is there still that 24 whatever seed like word backup process where you can retrieve it no. or how does that you work? just log in on another phone get another phone and log in wait so that, just I, like thought a, the just private like keys, I thought the key i thought the private keys in your in your case i'm saying with that i thought the private keys were on the person's phone sorry I missed they're that. on the person's phone but there's an encrypted backup on the cloud as well mm. and that's uh, synchronized between their different devices interesting yep. interesting interesting okay um and then the second thing I wanted uh, to ask you is a PayPal, right? So I think a lot yeah. of people listening to this might be like, well, PayPal allows you to buy Bitcoin and, you know, spend yeah. it and, and all that. So how is Edge, you know, maybe different on that front as well, just so people, you know, kind of kind of understand. Because in my understanding, pay PayPal, you're not actually holding any Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Yeah. PayPal is presumably holding Bitcoin on your behalf when you ask to buy. I presume that when I say I want to buy $1,000 of Bitcoin, they're buying $1,000 of Bitcoin off an exchange or in a partner that they're then holding to give you exposure to the price volatility. Um, they're not providing utility of that Bitcoin in, in any way, shape or form that actually is kind of Bitcoin's blockchain. So you can't withdraw that those funds. You can't deposit Bitcoin into your PayPal account using even any other exchange or self self hosted wallet. So it's ability for you to kind of join in the, you know, price exposure, purely that in a fully custodial manner. It's kind of what would happen. They're the equivalent of what would happen if the fat of rule went as, as draconian as you were concerned about, or you can't move crypto in and out of an exchange, right? That's, that would be PayPal. PayPal is their draconian nightmare. Um, if all of those fat of rules at their worst, became enacted interesting so, yes interesting. you don't have that you don't have that utility at all so that is one of the core differences but admittedly yes paypal a lot of people have access to it they have an account already they don't have another set of keys to manage or another set of credentials in edge that they'd have to manage so they are you know a valid um product to many people mm -hmm. many people are they're a fully valid product and i think a lot of these custodial products are fully valid in the era of uh, crypto speculation right because you don't care about using it you're just speculating on the price, but they completely break down in the era of 
crypto utility. I think Coinbase kind of sees that, which is why they even have a Coinbase wallet, even though it's not at all integrated. It's just like a side project. Um, but that's that I think is a key differentiator. And right now we are still in the speculative era. But we're trying to build a product that's relevant in both eras, right? So from a speculative era, Edge is relevant. You can acquire and trade. But then in the utility era, we can still become relevant because we can transact on real blockchains. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Almost I get certainly that. the custodial solutions won't be able to. I see the I see the method to your madness, uh, my friend. So, <laughs> hey, Paul, what's the uh, uh, what? Yeah. So anything else on edge, I guess, because we only had a few minutes left. I didn't realize we were kind of going that oh. fast with the clock. But um, what? Uh, yeah. Anything else on edge that you want to maybe share with people? Um, I don't know. Or, or did we kind of cover that enough? Do you think? I think I think we covered we a bunch. You know, I, we just just that we'd love to hear. You know, people's feedback, give the app a try, cool. edge.app, you know, buy edge. a little app. And then what about trade. people, well, I still had a one more question, but, uh, but since you're just bringing it up, where do people learn more about you as well? Like your, your, uh, Twitter handle, uh, Twitter handle, it, Twitter handle is pollinator, P A U double L. Nice. Yeah. yeah pollinator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nickname in high school. Um, but I don't tweet too much. Admittedly, where do, where, where's Twitter the best person. place? Like if people want to you know, tap into your consciousness? Like, do you write, write blog posts? Do you do anything? Are they, are like- uh... Really, admittedly, yeah, I'm kind of a, I'm, a, I'm more of an operations person in the company. Uh, so I'm not as publicly visible, except for when, you know, back in the days of conferences, uh, I, you know, love going to conferences and meeting people like physically, good old, you know, IRL in real life. And so I'm yeah, looking yeah, forward yeah. to getting back to that, that time frame. So when cool. that time frame does happen, you know, I will tweet about, you know, going to an event for sure. Yeah. I would love to meet anyone out there. So, you know, I'm definitely open to meet the community. Um, I love going to the meetups when they are once again in real life. Um, but otherwise, uh, if people really want to get kind of involved digitally, we do have a Slack channel. And if people are interested, we're open to invite people. It is invite only, but we don't really say no. Hey, hey Paul, know, so I forgot to ask, is, uh, was there. is Edge open source? Yes, no. actually. Yes, because we, we didn't talk about that at all, right? But it is. We are right? open that, source. That's, that is okay, cool. Strong, that's a kind of an important part of our belief. Yeah. Yes, we're open source. We're one of the few, if you know, we're one of the few multi-asset wallets that um, is open source. Interesting. That's a that's so, a big one. Okay. Yeah, it is. We do we do believe strongly in that. Um, you can see all our source code in in GitHub and multiple other companies use our source code as well for their apps. I think I interviewed so, uh, Kyle recently. He said he's, he's working with you guys. Kyle Kemper. He said, uh, Oh, Kemper. Yeah, no, he's like that is built. exactly. He's, he's in the process of trying to build a, an app using a lot of our, our code as well. So no, yeah, it's open source. Cool. For other cool. I love that. I love that. Um, just on the, on the kind of the last uh, question I was going to ask you. So is there a belief, a belief or truth that you hold that most other Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Oh God. Uh, where do I start? Um, right. <laughs> like, like Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is not, Bitcoin is not perfect. <laughs> um, Bitcoin needs uh, the ability to spend or it will die. Like I fundamentally believe you cannot, there's no such thing as a pure store of value, period. Like you, you have to be able to actually move that value. Otherwise it doesn't have any value. Um, and like, you know, especially because this is Bitcoin stories and, you know, maybe you appeal to the, a lot of the Bitcoin purists and maximalists, but I think there is room for other blockchains for sure. Um, Bitcoin doesn't have to do everything. It doesn't have to incorporate a lot of like financial services type of da DeFi stuff, but I think DeFi is absolutely critical. Um, if, if you look at our current financial infrastructure, we have money at the base level, and then we have financial services that sit on top of the money. If you think about all the different types of financial services. What is the simplest financial service that we've built on money today? The simplest, it's simply payments. People don't think of that as, you know, when you think DeFi, decentralized finance, no one thinks of payments as just being decentralized finance. No one thinks of just sending money as a, De as a DeFi product. And so therefore people don't think of a wallet that literally just talks to a blockchain to send from one address to another as DeFi. It's not cool enough to be DeFi. It's not complicated enough to be DeFi, but it, it, in a way it is. It's the simplest of DeFi. So now you take the financial system, a lot of companies built on top of the dollar are sending and receiving money. But a ton of where people put their money in that ecosystem is also services on top of it, insurance, loans, hedging, uh, stocks and bonds and whatnot. And if all we had is a decentralized money, 
all of those other services will end up becoming centralized services. And we won't have a choice, but putting our money, uh, but to put our money in a kind of custodial financial service, which eliminates a lot of the benefit of what Bitcoin was built for. So by having more decentralized financial services that give us the option, if not hopefully almost mandate, you know, because we don't want to use those options because they're cheaper, more accessible, by having decentralized financial services, we're eating into a bigger portion chunk of the legacy financial ecosystem. Because it's not just money, the base layer, it's now all the services on top of it, which people need to put their money in. So I think DeFi is absolutely critical. And I think the Bitcoiners that don't that just joke about it are short-sighted. I like that, man. I like that. I, I can get with that. I'm, I'm very critical of it too, but, uh, uh, but I think about it a lot because I think it's our, our yeah, for the same reasons you just mentioned. Okay. Uh, Paul, I don't, I want to be mindful of your time. And so I will let you go, but mm -hmm. if you enjoyed this next for sure. week, next month, next, whenever I'd be down to do like a follow-up. I mean, we could go down some deeper, you know, rabbit hole. <laughs> deeper I feel like rabbit I could talk to you forever, so man. Uh, same I love year. This. It's always been nice chatting whenever we, we meet in person. Yeah, yeah, this has been fantastic. So with that said, I'll uh, I'll bring it to a close.